Hello everyone, this is Brian Kelly from Association Mavens, where you get direct access to some of the foremost thinkers and teachers in the association industry. My guest today is Sarah Sladek. Sarah founded XYZ University to help organizations bridge generation gaps. She's an experienced marketing and membership professional who started researching demographic shifts in 2002. Sarah has authored three books plus numerous articles on generations and is a sought after keynote speaker and consultant. Thanks for joining me today, Sarah. Thank you, Brian. So to get our discussion started, I wanted to have you talk about XYZ uh, University. How did that start? You know, what's kind of the origins of it? Um, I'd love to hear the story. Sure. Well, I got my start in uh, membership associations, and I noticed a trend when I was working for an association. I kind of had a light bulb go off, and I thought, where are all the young people? We were really successful in our association at engaging um, a certain generation, baby boomer generation and older, but we were really struggling with engaging younger generations, generations X and Y and soon Z, which is coming up the ranks. And so, um, so I did a lot of research on this topic. I found out that the association I was working for was not the only association that was grappling with this problem. There were actually a lot of associations and even industries and companies that were also struggling to engage younger generations. And so I eventually left the association and started my own practice, which is been uh, going on for 10 years now, and uh, XYZ in XYZ University stands for Generations X, Y, and Z, and university meaning that we want to bring awareness and teach people about these generations, how to engage them, and why it's so important to have their participation. Now, before you started um, XYZ University, had there been anything out there like um, you know, your, your group where you're really exploring the generational aspects, or was it kind of a completely fresh idea? Well, it was a fresh idea as it pertains to membership associations. Yeah. There are other consultants out there that do work with corporations on how to engage young talent, but membership associations were being largely overlooked and uh, how to engage younger members and younger board and uh, even younger staff within associations. That's largely been overlooked. So we were really the first to um, focus on that particular industry. Got it. So how, how did this lead to you eventually writing uh, the end of membership book? What's the story behind that? Right. Well, um, before I wrote the end of membership as, as we know it, I wrote two other books, The New Recruit, What Your Association Needs to Know About X, Y, and Z. And again, that book was really focused on bringing awareness to associations, why generations, younger generations, were very important, critical to their succession planning. And then I wrote uh, Rockstars Incorporated, hiring the high maintenance, high performance, hot shots, half your age. Mm -hmm. And that was a fun one to write, but really, that one really focused on uh, the business world and corporate and how to engage young talent. And the reason I wrote that book, you know, is I worked with associations and I was touting, you've got to get younger generations involved. It was really kind of a catch-22 because if your members are businesses, well, and and they're struggling to engage young talent, how are your associations going to be able to engage young members? But then, um, then there were uh, some key things that happened in the industry. And uh, one of them is the economy mm -hmm. went to crap. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and associations really struggled during the recession. The other thing is that we've seen rapidly changing technology. Uh, there's been more technology developed in the last five years than in the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that really affects how associations engage with their members. And the third thing being demographic shifts. Um, we're seeing a very large, in fact, the largest turnover in human capital in history. We're seeing the baby boomers age and they make up the bulk of uh, membership associations, especially the leadership. And uh, as we approach 2015, 
uh, Generation Y, which is currently the youngest generation in the workforce, will actually become the largest, the majority of the workforce. Mm -hmm. And that's the first time that we've seen the youngest generation really take over um, and become the majority workforce and actually outnumber any other generation in the workforce. It's going to be fascinating. So anyway, these three things really kind of marked tremendous challenge and uh, conflict and, and, and obstacles and, and problems for associations who have been operating more or less under the baby boomer regime, um, more or less in a must-have membership economy and uh, members sought out the opportunity to join their associations, but now we have young people saying, oh, I don't know if I need to be part of an association, or people saying, oh, you know, when it comes down to dues and the economy's tough, I don't know if I need to join an association. So all of these things are creating this unique brew, and I thought it was a great time to write a book about these challenges, and basically what we're seeing as the end of membership as we know it. So I got to ask a question. Are the associations that you're working with, um, as you talk about these things and these concepts um, that are outlined in the book, are people freaking out? Are they embracing, <laughs> you know, some of the, the ideas that you're putting forth? Uh, are they burying their head in the sand? You know, is it a mix of all those things? I'd love to hear that from you. Right. I think it's a mix of all of those things. Um, and it kind of depends on where an association falls on the continuum. I do believe that right now, in comparison to maybe two, three years ago, um, we're seeing more associations realize, okay, we can't bury our heads in the sand anymore. And that's because they're seeing rapid declines in membership, they're seeing declines in revenue, and, uh, and it's one of those kind of slap upside the head saying, oh my gosh, we're running out of time. We have to make change. So they're, they, they're being forced into it a little bit. But there are associations out there that have embraced the change and seen the change as opportunity to reinvent themselves. Unfortunately, I think um, those are few and far between. I'd like to see more associations get past this idea that change is a bad idea, change is scary. Um, you know, with great challenge comes great opportunity, and, and it's, a, it's an opportunity for associations to really think about how do we create the future and how will we be relevant in the future. Yeah, great. So let's talk a little bit more about the end of membership. Uh, in the book, you've got some really great concepts. You've got some really great examples. Um, so some of the, the things that I was kind of tuning into while reading it, um, first and foremost was this... Um, you know, idea of these elements, the three elements of niche, culture, and dues. So I wanted to ask you, you know, why are these elements essential or why do you believe these are essential for an association to be dominant? Right. I'm glad you asked that question. Okay. <laughs> so let's start with niche. Well, niche is incredibly important because perhaps you're familiar with the book, Blue Ocean Strategy. Absolutely. But it's this idea that, um, that there's a lot of sharks in the water and, and a lot of fish in the water. And where the fish congregate, the sharks also congregate. In other words, if you don't really stand out from the crowd, uh, you're going to be uh, eaten by sharks. You're going to be gobbled up. And uh, that's not a good thing, a good place to be. Yeah. Niche is important because it, you have to distinguish yourself from the competition. And there's a lot of competition out there right now. There's a lot of associations that are starting up because it's easy to start an association um, that's virtual, that's based on technology. Um, so we have to really distinguish ourselves from the competition. And also, our marketplace is getting a lot more choosy about how they spend their money, and that goes back to economic shifts. Yeah. So people are saying, well, maybe I was a member of five of industry associations in the past, but now I'm going to be more careful with my resources. I want to go to the association that's the best, not just the largest, but the best. The one that gives me the greatest return on investment, the most value. And so, um, so that's where niche comes into play. As for culture, 
um, culture is more important now than ever, again, because people are choosy, but also we see real generational differences when we talk about culture. Because the baby boomers love to get into an association or a company for that matter, and they don't mind rolling up their sleeves and fixing something that's broken. And um, younger generations say, nope, I don't want to be a mechanic. I want to get in the car and drive. I want it to be a great experience. And if it's not a great experience, I have no qualms about disengaging and finding something else to meet my needs and interests. So culture is incredibly important right now. It's a deciding factor as we look at um, marketing and we look at membership and, and we look at uh, how we ch make our choices now, especially by generation. And, uh, and culture plays a heavy part in that. And um, as for dues, you know, dues are, are what makes a membership association. People pay dues to be part of a great experience, to be part of a community, to feel like they belong, to feel like uh, their problems are being solved. And I think that's a big piece of it. We've seen this move from, from people just joining an association because it's the right thing to do and they want to support their industry or certain cause. But now, because of economic shifts, demographic shifts, all those things, now we see people saying, um, I'm going to be a part of an association because I believe it will help me solve a problem. Mm -hmm. And so when an association falls short of solving that problem, it doesn't matter whether you're charging $5 for dues or $500 for dues, people will not engage. So people are being very choosy and selective in how they spend their time and their resources. So it's very important that an association looks at how are we addressing all these issues? Are we the best? Are we providing an exceptional experience? Are we providing a real cost to value ratio? Something that provides great benefit to those who are paying dues. Yeah. Excellent. Now, I, I had an interview last week with Jeff DeCanya, and we were talking about this notion of kind of doing away with this membership model and looking for new business models. Um, you know, are, are you kind of along those same lines of thinking, or do you think it's just really focusing on providing better value, um, you know, in exchange for that dues uh, scenario? Um, I think it depends on the association. You have to really think about um, you have to really think about what works best for your membership and what your membership needs. I mean. When we look at associations, on the one hand, when you look at associations, the first associations in the United States emerged in the 1600s. And uh, it's basically been the same model ever since mm -hmm. then. But because we've had such tremendous change uh, occur in these last you know, 10, 20 years, it's important, it's imperative that associations kind of rethink that membership model, that idea of I'm going to pay dues once a year and I'm going to pay the same dues as everybody else and have the same benefits and package offerings and access that everyone else has. That I think is coming into question. Whether we'll actually see the, uh, you know, the membership model completely um, die out and evolve into something else, I think that remains to be seen. And I think that might be a slow and gradual movement if we do go to that step. But, but I do believe that um, associations have to start rethinking this idea of contracts almost with members. This, um, and I think we'll see more customization within the membership. I think we'll start seeing um, uh, being able to pay month by month rather than sign a year-long contract, so to speak. Um, I think we'll start seeing change, definitely, but um, but I don't know that the you know the dues model and the idea of some of the membership features are going to go completely away, at least not right away. Yeah. Okay. So another concept that you put forth in the book is this um, notion of membership. Um, versus, you know, like outcomes versus features of the membership. So why is it more powerful to list 
out the outcomes of what somebody will get out of the membership versus just listing the features. Right. Well, um, because outcomes sell. And right now, uh, you know, I think you could pull up just about any association website and go to their join now section and see all the benefits and they'll be listed out. Things like um, you get a printed listing in the membership directory. Whoop de doo. Mm -hmm. um, you get a discount on going to the annual conference. Again, whoop de doo. Um, unfortunately, associations have become a little bit lazy in what they offer, what they truly deliver to associations. So step one is really looking at is what we offer valuable? It, does it really make sense for someone to join this association or does it make sense for them to come to everything as a non-member and pay something slightly higher? Do we really provide something exclusive that they can't get anywhere else? Do we really provide something of benefit? So that's number one. Mm -hmm. But also, um, you know, it's looking at things like rather than talking about printed listing in the membership directory and some of these things as features, it's thinking about membership and humanizing membership. It's thinking about membership in a way that people can really relate to and making it measurable and tangible. And again, this goes back a little bit to generations and, and a little bit about, you know, when, as we look at our changing marketplace and landscape, younger generations, they want to know what's the bottom line? I don't want to see all these features. I want to really know the measurable, the tangible, the real value. And so uh, we see this a lot in retail. You know, uh, we'll have a tissue manufacturer. You know, if I held up a tissue and I said, well, this tissue is square and white and you use it to blow your nose, you would say, well, yeah, Sarah, that's obvious. Well, because <laughs> those are just features. It doesn't make any difference. You know, again, we're set, we want to sell memberships. We want to be competitive. This goes back to niche. And uh, we want to show value. We have to show value to, to be able to compete now. So rather than saying it's square white and you use it to blow your nose, instead saying by using this brand of tissue, you will help prevent the spread of germs by 99%. Then people go, oh, okay, I get it. I understand why that brand delivers more value and deserves my resources and my time in comparison to the other brands. And associations really, really could learn a lot from retail in that aspect. Excellent. So another concept that you talk about is this idea of three common types of associations that fail to deliver member value. Um, you've got the Scrooge Association, the Milk Association, and the Antique Association. Um, can you extrapolate a little bit more on that and um, kind of tell me what you mean exactly by the three of those and um, you know what the differences are? Right, right. Well, the Scrooge Association is an association that, uh, that nickel, nickels and dimes their members. And, um, you know, I... I for the past 15 years I've worked with associations and I've seen my share of associations that have this idea that we have to generate more revenue. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start charging people for everything. And then one day the members kind of wake up and they say, wait a second, I pay dues and I have to pay for all these programs and all these services. And I also have to pay for these benefits and I have to pay for the annual conference and I have to do this and that. And all of a sudden they say, wait a second, where is my member value? What is the point of paying dues? And that's when they disengage. And so a Scrooge Association is one that's really concerned about um, money, overly concerned to the point where it's detrimental. And they lose their focus on membership ROI. And membership ROI is always going to be the best long-term investment as opposed to putting all your focus and energies on short-term or program or um, you know instant gratification ROI. It's investing in the membership value and, uh, and delivering more to your members. So that's the Scrooge Association. The Milk Association, I'll give you an example of that. 
Um, I joined an association a few years ago. I joined on the spot at this event I went to because I was so impressed by this event. There were hundreds of people there. It was very well run. Um, it was very impressive. So I joined the association and a few months after that, I started thinking, well, wait a second, what else is my membership buying? And I couldn't really find a lot of value throughout the rest of the year. And it turned out that this association was really getting all of its members and generating a large portion of its revenue through one event a year. The rest of the year, they kind of skimmed the surface. That's a milk association. It's like you're skimping, you're skimming um, by and you're putting all of your eggs in one basket as opposed to saying, we're going to be a very robust association. We're going to be a cash cow, basically. Yeah going to um, really focus on delivering benefit to members throughout the entire year. And again, you have very picky consumers right now. People are wanting, they're demanding a lot more than ever before and, and your association needs to deliver. And um, let's see, okay, and then the third one, oh, the Antique Association. Oh. So the Antique Association is one, if, if I said, let's say Rotary, um, everybody knows what Rotary is. Rotary has been around for years. Um, Rotary does a lot for communities. It's an association that has a lot of brand recognition. Everybody knows what that association is, what it stands for, and it has a lot of longevity. But these are associations that tend to struggle to make change. So, um, so I'm working with an association right now and uh, the average age of their membership is 57. Mm. It's an association that's been around for many years, but they have failed to make change. And so now they're getting to this point where, oh my gosh, we're losing so many members. Our members are aging so quickly. Um, we're actually losing some members to death because uh, people, people are staying on as members well into their 60s and 70s. But if the average age of your membership is 57, it doesn't matter what kind of brand reputation you have. You have to start thinking younger. You have to turn that antique into a commodity. You have to make it something valuable and relevant to the next generation of members or your association risks uh, dying out, literally. Yeah. Well, I'm really interested in how these ideas are, are making an impact in the association industry. And I, I wonder, are you finding that associations are kind of self-identifying and saying, well, you know, we see ourselves as this one or we see ourselves as that one? Uh, or is it something that as a consultant, you're actually, you know, working to point these these characteristics out to them and then, you know, implement a plan uh, or a path forward to start changing some of these? Right. What I find um, as a consultant that is really challenging is that a lot of times the staff the association staff will recognize we have a problem and um, and they may identify with with some of these challenges as I'm mentioning here in this conversation today or maybe it's other things but for whatever reason they're declining members they're declining in revenue and they say oh my gosh we've got a problem but the unfortunate thing about well, it's a blessing and a curse, I guess. Mm -hmm. But um, one of the challenges that associations face is that the staff can recognize there's an issue, but then they have to sell it to the board. And the, and the board has to understand that um, we have to make some changes to turn this association around, to turn the Titanic around. Yeah. And, uh, and that's uh, easier said than done. A lot of times um, the staff will say, to me, we recognize we have to make change and then they'll take it to the board and it's a much more difficult process to convince the board because let's face it, a lot of boards are elected for a two year term or a three or four year term. They just want to put their time in. They want the association to be healthy and happy and prosperous. They don't want to make any major change and have it backfire on their watch. Um, and, uh, you know, and unfortunately then no change happens. So I think that we're seeing increased awareness. We're even seeing some increased activity and movement towards change, but there's still a long ways to go. Mm. Got it. 
Um, the last couple of things I wanted to touch upon was exploring a bit more the, the generational aspects um, of, of what is in the end of membership. So in the book, you talk about three key drivers for both Gen X and Gen Y, and that those are leadership, learning, and making a difference. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, why is it important for associations to understand uh, these three areas? Because generations X and Y hold the purse strings. You know, uh, it's a, it's, um, it's, we're only beginning to see some of the shift that's going to take place. And if you think about it as a huge roller coaster, you know, we had the baby boomer generation was the largest of their era. They've been in power for a long time. And um, that's 78 million people. And then Generation X was a very small population at 48 million people. Uh, But Generation Y is 80 million people, so even larger than the boomers. But the thing is, when you combine Generation Y with Generation X, you're at 120 million people. And that's a that's a large majority, and they're going to become and already are we're already seeing signs of this, um, extremely influential. And uh, and so the things that they crave, um, learning, leadership, uh, they they like a lot of uh, feedback, motivation. They want to be part of a positive culture, and the other piece of this, and I mentioned this earlier, you know, baby boomers don't. They're they're more loyal. They will stick around. They will see an association through or a brand through tough times. And uh, generations X and Y, not so much. The experience isn't exceptional. If they aren't seeing real return on value and investment, they disengage. They are not as loyal. They're very elusive, Mm -hmm. selective, difficult to reach uh, generations. So associations have to be aware of their, their needs, their interests, their wants, their expectations, because they are the future or the future leaders, future members, without them, an association simply cannot survive. Bottom line, they're the only succession plan an association has. So um, as an example, you know, with learning and leading, uh, just think about it. The majority of our leadership in pretty much every industry, with maybe the exception of technology, is um, is held by baby boomers. Mm-hmm. You know, Generation X, the oldest Xers right now are 48, and they still are struggling to get into some of those leadership roles because mm-hmm. there are no roles open until those boomers start retiring. Yeah. But when they do start retiring, Generation X and Y are going to be hungry for mm-hmm. leadership opportunities, but they may not have a lot of leadership experience. You know, all the all these shifts and all these changes, that's where associations can really thrive. They need to step in and be a resource and be thinking about the future, be thinking about workforce development, skill development, leadership development, because um, because because the marketplace and the industry really, really needs those things. And uh, and the next generation, as I mentioned, is the only succession plan got to think about them and their needs. So, you know, it seems like with with Gen X and probably even more so with Gen Y that um, they're kind of bucking this idea of, you know, I'm not interested in joining a membership organization. Um, With that being the case, do you think it's feasible for associations to really reposition themselves to where they are attractive enough for this generation? Or do you think that um, you know, Gen Y is going to say, well, this is, you know, we're going to create our own group, uh, whether it's informally structured or not. Uh, do you see anything like that happening? Um, or do you think it is realistic that associations can, can step up and, and make a change that is attractive to this generation? Right. I'm seeing both. And I often tell associations to think about their association like a buffet. So for a really long time, your association's been serving pizza, and everyone that came to your restaurant loved your pizza because you made the best pizza ever. <laughs> and um, and then one day, someone walks into your restaurant and they say, "Hey, I don't really like pizza. Do you have anything else?" 
So does that mean you get rid of the pizza? No. It means that you need to start thinking about um, other menu options and um, uh, you know to, to keep those new customers and di diversifying your menu. So you don't want to get rid of the things that have brought you success thus far. You don't want to alienate the boomer generation. Yeah. But you've got to start thinking about how to engage the younger generation. Now, I, I don't think, I, I really think that um, saying they're not joiners, um, they have no interest in associations, I, I don't think there's any truth to that whatsoever. I think younger generations are very passionate about membership and about associations if they feel that there's a place for them in the association, if they feel they belong, if they feel their opinions are valued, and if they feel they're getting uh, value out of paying dues and that there's real benefit for them. Mm. So, you know, that's where we see things like um, being accessible 24 hours a day, seven days a week, having online education, um, you know, really thinking about ways to deliver program services and benefits that appeal to these younger generations. And if you don't, you're not, you're alienating them and then they won't engage. It will be a very difficult uphill battle. All right. Well, one last question for you before we wrap up. Um, I wanted to ask, are you speaking um, at the ASAE annual conference? I thought, thought I saw your name on the list. And, I am. Okay. So what's the session? Right. It's, uh, it's one of the conversations that matter. It's kind of a, you know, a dialogue, a deep dive on the book and this idea of the end of membership and how to sustain your association in light of some of the current challenges. So promises to be a, a good discussion, fun time. Excellent. All right, Sarah. Well, thanks so much for your time and for doing this interview. Uh, and thank you to everyone for watching. Be sure to sign up today in the upper right corner of this website to be updated via email when new interviews are posted. Also, be sure to follow at Brian Kelly now on Twitter to stay on top of all things Association Mavens related. Lastly, please submit your recommendation for which Association Maven you'd like to see interviewed next. Thanks again for watching, and I look forward to bringing you more great interviews. Bye-bye.